recording. So welcome everyone to today's event with uh, the Dante Alighieri Society of BC in Vancouver. My name is Arianna Danino and I am the cultural events coordinator. Here with us we have today Sara Fruner, Italian poet who lives in New York and uh, she will tell us about the lights and the and the shadows, let's say, of her life in uh, Manhattan. Uh, with us, we have Renato Zane, our president, and Stefano Gulmanelli, our vice president, Federica Ferruda, our treasurer. So uh, without further ado, let's uh, ask Sara to step up <laughs> and take the mic and yes. uh, tell us about her poetic journey uh, throughout Manhattan. Yes. First of all, I have to thank you, Arianna, and to thank the Dante Alighieri Society of British Columbia for inviting me. Um, I accepted the invitation enthusiastically um, because for many reasons, let's say. The first is that I share a special bond with Canada, actually. And by telling you this, um, you learn something about my path. Okay. Um, I studies as a literary translate, tr literary translator. Um, so um, right after uh, my two master's degree and uh, master of philosophy in translation studies, I started translating books. And um, the first job that I landed was to translate Dion Brand. And the own brand in, is one of the most eminent writers and poets and thinkers that you have in Canada. So uh, I translated her to novels, two novels of hers. She wrote more um, poetry of hers. And also I came to the Banff, the, the Banff Center for the Arts in Alberta as a translator in residence. And, and then I was in Toronto uh, as a panelist uh, during a conference on Brand's work. And there I met, you know, truly amazing scholars, people in general, and fellow translators. So for me, it's really a pleasure, you know, to, to be here in Canada with you. I feel I am in Vancouver, actually. Um, so my heart really leapt up when um, Ariana re reached out to me and, and uh, you know, I accepted with joy. So um, let me go back one second to my experience as a translator, which is um, like vital for me, you know, I really owe a lot to translation. Uh, I consider translation a true uh, art form. So the experience with Dion Brand um, shaped me as a translator, but also as a writer and as a poet. Uh, I also am a fiction writer, so I am a novelist as well. So maybe you guys want to know. Um, so I learned to dig later it does on a daily basis, basically, you know, we disassemble and re reassemble uh, our own language constantly. It is, however, like, a, I don't know, a misconception or a common belief to consider the source language as the language we need to master uh, to translate properly. And that's a major misinterpretation. Uh, the knowledge of the target uh, language, language is just as relevant as the knowledge of the source language. So I am telling you this because digging into words um, is basically what poets do uh, every day when they work on their own uh, you know, poetry. So poetry for me has much to do with speleology, as I say. A poem plunges downward to progress forward. Um, so by translating, I found how I find out I found out how muscular 
a line can get through a poignant uh, use of a verb or through the use of suspension or repetition. And how, for instance, delivering levity uh, or music where music needs to be created is extremely difficult to achieve. Uh, so challenges uh, while translating have cracked me uh, open, I would say, <laughs> uh, but they pieced me together anew in a way. So this is the, the start. So how I started out as a translator, and I am still a translator, uh, and I'm proud to be actually. So, but, you know, after years, in Italy, uh, and I called them like Mashturmundrang ears, so uh, spent in looking for what was missing, I eventually made it to New York in 2016, at the end of 2016. And I moved to Sugar Hill, uh, Harlem, after longing for this city for almost 10 years. Um, I really wanted to leave the city for a certain amount of time, which by the way, is still unknown to me. So I'm here now, but you know, I, I don't know exactly how long. And you know, it, it, it's good to experience this uncertainty, I think. Um, and now if you'll allow me, I will uh, like share my, uh, my screen and a PowerPoint. Uh, so that you have an idea. Let me see if you, so you can see it, right? Yes. yes. Benissimo. Let and me. Full screen. Yes, full, full screen. Is it on full screen? Not yet. Yes, yep. now. Yes, like this so is okay. Is it now? Yes, good. Benissimo. Um, so, as I said, uh, end of 2016, um, and 2016 was a peculiar year, and November especially was a peculiar month, because I arrived here a week before the elections, those elections, and um, those elections were followed in this city by a very dismal suspended time during which the city was full on shell shocked, I promise, completely at a loss for words. And it was really a frightening moment because, you know, we didn't really see it coming, you know? So um, yeah, it was a, a week, yes, a week before that. Um, and I, I will never, never forget the eerie or kind of some time to, to read into it. But then I got it. Um, the city was instantly responding to that historic event and mourning uh, right away the death of an era. Um, and then after a few days, the city pulled, pulled itself together and poured angry New Yorkers let me see if I can, let me, oh, let me see if I can go on. I think I need to, sorry about this. Um, let me go back to this. I'm sorry, I need to have this on the side, otherwise I cannot navigate it. So yes, uh, as I was saying, um, the city pulled itself together and poured angry New Yorkers in the streets, you know? So I experienced this um, and you can see it uh, by the crowds. So the elation of being finally where I wanted to be was marred by the unpleasant feeling that the entire world and not just the US actually, had halted and stepped back into some sort of, you know, new middle ages regarding major longstanding issues like race disparities, violence on women, immigration, and a wave of conservatism and isolationism was building up uh, all over the world, all over the world, very strong and very wide. I mean, Italy, France, Brazil, 
uh, Great Britain with Brexit. So um, the title of the collection that I'm going to speak about, Bitter Bites from Sugar Hills, is partly autobiographical and partly metaphorical. I was truly living in Sugar Hill, which is a 10 block long neighborhood in West Harlem between 145th Street and 155th Street. And that tasted very sweet, I can tell you. And by the way, a little bit of history. Sugar Hill got its name in the 19, 1920s um, when the neighborhood became a popular place for wealthy African Americans. And so to live during the Harlem Renaissance. And so people like, for instance, Duke Ellington and W.E.B. Du Bois used to live in Sugar Hill. And nowadays, the neighborhood, the population is very diverse, like mostly African Americans and Latin Americans. So you know, to have you an idea of the neighborhood. So heels of sugar. Uh, so it, again, it was sweet, yet my mouth was a wash also with bitterness by what we were experiencing on a global level and in the US particularly. And that conflicting taste came to inform my poetry as well. Um, a little bit of a digression here. Um, sometimes I sense a misconception about poetry. Um, since its form is refined and uh, elevated or simply other than fiction or the, the everyday language, um, poetry is wrongly considered like ethereal or light years of, away from the everyday, which is actually the very opposite. Poetry is covered with dirt for me. It comes from the earth, from our dirty world, I would say. And mine makes no difference. So my verses could not stay away from the miseries that were around me and that I saw around me. So those collectively relevant issues that I mentioned before, like immigration, violence and women, racism, leaked into my page. And my page turned political in this. And um, you can notice this uh, in a couple of poems that I'm going to read to you. And the first one is titled A Spring Now, and it opens the book. Um, and you will see that the immigration vocabulary um, and the bureaucracy around immigration actually um, affect even seasons. So that's Spring Now. Wearing pink air as a balaclava, and first concocting, then humming, a crispy war cry. It is sabotaging winter, heading to outshine. Criminal and terrorist, the only legitimate green card holder, has entered the country, smuggling in a cargo of color and wonder. And on this same track, um, I will read Amnesia. My body swimming, belly blinking at the sea floor, back flirting with the sky above. In a matter of seconds, a big shape shade grope the girly light. Just a cloud passing by, I thought jovially, or some prehistoric bird making fun of the sun. Back on the beach, my moves stopped, my mouth dropped, the feeling of skin getting snagged amid itch and stretch. No matter the amnesia you can buy for cheap, you never get away from the day you live. And another one is black, blank, sorry, blank is the color of lost memory. 
So I landed in the US in the moment where the cancel culture was starting to stir in a very you know, massive way. So this is a poem about the risks of hiding or erasing our cumbersome historical pasts. Blank is the color of lost memory. History reeks and throbs. Its skin is covered in sores and boils since when the ape men killed bunnies and bucks to shut up his growling guts. A demolition bowl to level uneven grounds and clear out thorny yards is called Soweto. The fabrication of a space to lodge an easy waste, turning unwelcome subjects into welcome outcasts, be they of flesh or iron, marble or cotto, is called a ghetto. Blank is the color of lost memory. Only by having troubles and unease, plague and disease, shining red and rot on your daily track, there is a chance for your face to use a grimace for a question mark to fire the murk of single thought. So this is kind of my political poetry, I would say, but of course it's not all this. The relocation here provided me with a cityscape that has welcomed with all its harsh contradictions, my poetic self. So I started cruising the streets, searching people's eyes and bodies that the city narrates every day, every night. New York, as I say, is a, is a storyteller that nobody can really silence. It is an extraordinary repository of diverse humanity. But it soon find out it was not all sunshine and rainbows. It was not. And another uh, small digression here. In Italy, we grow up with a certain idea of America, and especially New York. We gobble down movies and TV shows about New York that present us with this sort of iconography, right? This and this. And here we have some movies. So Once Upon a Time in America. And here we have views with the water towers and Times Square, right? Or these amazing sunsets that the city presents us with. Or this is, by the way, Fifth Avenue during the pandemic. So nobody was around and it was pretty spooky, I would say, you know, it was deserted. Or Columbus Circle. So this is the idea, you know, the, the iconography that we have. I also grew up devouring books and arts about New York. So for instance, you know, um, my dear friend, Alden Caulfield <laughs> of The Catcher in the Rye and his dilemma, um, where would the ducks of Central Park go when the Southern Lake freezes all over? So this is one of my, let's say, first books about New York that I read, okay? Or to mention a classic of poetry, um, Whitman, um, you know, the forever faces and the interminable eyes that Whitman asks for in Give Me the Splendid Silent Sun, which is an enthusiastic ode to New York City. So I grew up with all this, but I also grew up with uh, art about New York, you know, so opera, for instance. Um, you know, you see this, you see a picture and then you see it live, right? Like, this, and this is actually a restaurant right around, around like my behind my corner, actually. <laughs> so
So the cinematographic, the literary, and the artistic representation that we get of the city stands out so vividly and is so overwhelmingly influential on constructing our own individual imagery that when we arrive here for the first time, we have the feeling we know the place. And maybe that's also part of the reason why the fish out of water of the world that swim to the city feel immediately at home in its waters. They have experienced them in their imagination of a four. And if you think of it, um, the idea of a thing is the first house of that very thing. So, but I said before, no sunshine and rainbows, right? I was faced with the opposite. I discovered beauty in the city could sparkle with horror and also trauma and disgust. This contrast caught me by surprise and open up uh, new emotional territories that my mind itched to explore. Um, we are used to a different kind of what I'm saying. It comprises the landscape, um, the artistic heritage, the way people walk and talk and gesture. I personally come from Trentino. I haven't mentioned it yet. Uh, Trentino is a region in the, in the north, in the very north, which is a fairy tale like region immersed. Uh, in green and cleanliness and silence. So totally different scenario from the city. In New York, I've learned, and it was a major discovery for me, I've learned that different aesthetics were possible. The aesthetics of ugliness was possible, and particularly the aesthetics of the struggle, as New York is a hungry creature of a city that demands a lot from you in terms of energy, balance, grit, poise, mercy, you name it. So to quote David Bowie, there is a sense of urgency in this town. And it's, uh, it was absolutely right. Urgency means need. New York attracts those who feel something is missing. Something is missing in their life. It is the city, I would say, where unfulfilled desire is king, an unquenchable thirst queen. And at, at one point in your life, or maybe more than at one point, as far as I am concerned, you feel that way. You feel consumed by longing. And New York then becomes your Mecca and welcomes you as a wandering pilgrim. So for the restless souls consumed by longing and at pains finding their own place, New York immediately appears as an easy dispenser of longing. I mentioned Whitman before. I think there was in me some sort of Whitmanesque elan towards the city an attraction at first towards the hustle and bustle, the skylines, the cinephile vibes, which are there and are, oh my God, and fun, but they are soon eclipsed and replaced but, but by something more interesting, far more interesting and deep. An attraction that quickly veered from the conventional towards the small, and the unnoticed, the wretched, the invisible, the discarded, the lost. So I detected a, a shift in the way I perceived the city. I started looking horizontally rather than vertically. I, began, I say I began to care for pavements more than skyscrapers and you can see it here you know it's just to give you these pictures are to give you a sense of this process of shifting
so the, the, the discarded, the, the small, the tiny, um, started to inform my, my writing and really to trigger my curiosity, you know? So in this collection, I did not really mean to command the city. Dreams. I was, was given and what was, uh, let's say, um, chanting the patent gorgeousness of breathtaking views. What is already there and visible um, can be left to fiction uh, as far as I am concerned or to tourists or travel guides for that matter. The tiniest and the disproportionate, the doleful and the down and out, the broken, the beaten and the bruised, all these and many others are the beloved subjects of my quest as a poet here. So I tried to capture how imperfect and flawed and even nightmarish the city can get how uneven its skin is, its flesh raw. And mind you, I came out of a place of love because I deeply love New York City, but I tried to be in a way objective. I believe a poet's duty is to present the reader with views of reality that include unexpected side paths leading out of the expected picture bringing them to somewhere or somewheres they would not ever envisage to get to. So contradictoriness is crucial in this collection. And that is true also for spaces in New York that you love and hate at the same time. And the subway is one of them. Anthropology in the making is what I usually name New York City subway. Um, you spend, or I spend, a lot of time there, and in the space of a ride, uh, you can find yourself very far away from the carriage you sit or stand, simply by looking at somebody's, you know, face or, or feet. And here I collected some pictures for you, and that they might give you like a taste of what I mean by this, okay? So to me, this kind of picture kind of reminds me of movies, like of the film of the movie, right? So you can find really every sort of, you know, people, details. I love the way she, she looks at him here. here. So sad. I like what it what she does with her feet, reading, you know, when you are so immersed in your reading. <laughs> oh, sorry. I think I 
just went too far away here from my, sorry about this. Ah, here, yes, sorry, here, here. Uh, here, this, I love this picture. Okay, so you have basically an idea what I'm speaking about, you know, about the, the, the subway. Um, and I'm reading a couple of poems um, that are about the subway. So one is titled Subway Semantics. The leak of beer, the lake it feeds, the feet close by, the face beside. In rush hours, arms and legs flood with elegies, stairways and trains. Having no ideas of all the pages they are leaving behind in the bustling cloud. The lingos on air, the careless looks, the horny hand, the broken film. Subway semantics, overturns aesthetics, sounding like music, but chanting no ethics. And another one, Sleeping Beauty. The opulent breath of decadent meals saturates gaps among edgy silences over working lunches. Someone in the subway has spilled milk on the platform edge. The universe might think to stop and collect its dropped lot, its lost path. You can walk by, bury your eyes in your little smart pit, devote yourself to God the unnoticed, playing online chess or Mr. Success, wearing headphones, looking business. When one day you look up and find the city staring at your shameless dozing, your senses numb with too much no, stars gone forever on a morning floor. You will pray for some remedy, some new stink to please reek by, kiss you away from the dead deathbed of your sleepy eye. So um, I personally find grace in a limping leg, in a tired look, in on a sad face. And if you hunt for those things, you're spoiled for choice here. Any corner of the city I navigated, any passenger I stared at was a receptacle of a story or just a splinter of a story. Sometimes they inspired poems directly, but most of the time they simply created like a certain sentiment, an atmosphere, that worked like a nebula for a baby stars, a nursery where the poem would slowly or very quickly form and tumble out. When I speak about direct inspiration, I refer to, I refer to poems like these two ones. One is called Nefertiti. And um, I really, saw this woman, this beautiful woman in the Bronx, I was running and, you know, I knew that I had to write a poem about her. So when I get home and I got home, I wrote a poem about her. Nefertiti. The molecular structures get rearranged in the bodies of passersby and never dwells. When Nefertiti steps out of past glories, out of noble agonies to head to Clay Avenue, the sun setting its warm hand on her silky nape like a tender friend. The unexpected, the syntax, arts and gods write their epics in the inn of heaven or the pit of Belmont. Belmont is a part of the Bronx. And the other one is titled apparent catastrophe and 
I was listening to a concert um, in a church and um, on 42nd Street. And a, a tiny old lady came in and she was uh, an homeless. And I was immediately struck by her. She was so tiny. And, you know, you will hear her presence here. A battalion of battered angels shuffled by their bleeding wings, their burning brains. The black body of a beetle breaks the spell of a white museum as it decides to cross its pinnit platinum. A church grows gibbous and the music falls when a woman's hunch enters the holy hall of nights in the cold she smells after all. Still, an arch of light flashes in your mouth when you bow your neck to a public tag. In the poems I'm going to read now to you, um, there was no specific and straight inspiration from a person or a place. The poems just shimmered into being in the New York City nebula. And I will just show you some pictures here. If I let me find one. So these are subjects that kind of, you know, are in the city and get my attention when I pass by. And then for you know, they they are in my poetry way, I would say. So for instance, this lady here, this man standing there alone, or kids playing in Central Park, homeless people, you know, in front of a church. This is the Bronx, the Bronx. This is something that always attracts my attention, the geometries that the city can build. For me, this is the urban version of a Kandinsky. Or these sort of landscapes. This is again the Bronx. This of course is a little bit of I iconic New York City. And This is Coney Island. I will read a poem about it for me. It's a special place. And uh, yeah, so I will read that poem to you later. So um, let me if, find- Sorry the... if I interrupt yes. you. Yes. Uh, uh, is there something, do you, are you having um, in your mic that, because there is always a kind of um, a sound that really bothers your voice, unfortunately, when no, you. No, I, I, I don't. I'm not using a direct mic, so it's the PC mic. I don't uh, know what okay. it is. Okay. Mm, I'm sorry okay, about this. Okay, I will try to we, speak louder. We can hear, but sometimes we we lose some of the words, which is I a pity. But... Okay, I will try to speak louder. Also, that may help. Okay. Good. Yes. Thank so, you. Well, you're welcome. Um, the purple hibiscus. A purple hibiscus blooms on her cheekbone. No displaced tattoo, no messy foundation, but of consensus, a simple perversion. She's no child. She's tried dire straits. Her breast has fed one girl and one boy who've grown and left. Now she's alone with her men and his ghosts, with the, with the Bible in her brains, a body of skin and bone, plus the rosary she shells. She thinks life is this, work and church, mop, then lunch, bodega of her friends, Laundry to get done, a traveling exhibition of rare archaeology, 
that is what she is. Colored strata of history written on her complexion. Or maybe a murderer killing her time with the knickknacks of her legacy as a woman and partner waiting for the very end of the real beginning. And then the oppressed. Yes, absolutely the oppressed. The oppressed. You think they enjoy going to the movies, getting wild at parties, crumbing their woofers, their cars and attitude with rage and sexism, not to mention solitude. The world is one thing, hard as a distance between a nod and a no. But the truth is the oppressed sing in the well of themselves. Sitting on this hill, my hopes dangling on the branch of disbelief, my eyes sore with too much watching, I spot history dumping the past and curling up right here and now. It's filthy boot under a silky gown. And solo dancer. So New York City is also the city of solitude or loneliness. It depends on, you know, on which perspective you are looking at it. Solo dancer. Graffiti gargoyles greet you guys in the cave of beauty, the den of decay. Molded carpets, failed portraits, bodega bags, carrying cargoes of personal mess. You are a solo dancer, shouts the madman on the KFC corner. You must dance solo in this city, in the world. Don't wait for the nod, for the green go-go. No one will save you. No plastic, no botox, no shrink, no peel. Mind the madman and his rotten bill. Um, I would say all that glitters is not gold. Bursting briefcases of cocaine brains, gun lungs pumping under high slide coats before a stupid joke at a pharmacy clerk. Armpits reeking of bourgeois fear when the working class stares at the uptown ease. Sometimes it happens, you turn a clean hand, anticipating rays, and you're greeted by five smiles of dirt and their overgrown nails. And then maybe something a bit more positive. City rules. The city has plans you would never figure, wits you will soon discover. It fools you around by dropping a psychic where a bar used to be, an event on a ring of skunk if it feels oddly eccentric. The city feasts on blood after killing a family diner for a big department store. It wrapped the scene in national tissue paper while choking the gore with silver caricature. Then, all of a sudden, when you've fallen from such heights that even clouds are afraid to tell, let alone sail, when your heart is a shipwreck and the world a remote coast, the city picks you up, strides your rags, kisses salty tracks above your cheeks and sends you back to your new old self by bursting just simply into a blue noon or a jazz thing. And let's see, sour and sweet. Sour is the taste of skies some days. You spot bribery in your parlor, 
Grease graffiti on the bus window, your brimful head uses as a pillow. You hear melodies sinking in a trumpet case when a musician, a Motown miracle, trades his gift for a rent controlled flat. You feel the rugged skin of bygone hopes reaching out to your clench when you make your way across chess players, Krishna preachers, voodoo kings, and faith healers. In one word, the offspring Union Square delivers from Sunday to Sunday on the bed of its stairway. When your love is too honest, the soup boiled over and a syllable is not enough, you please read the poem a single head leaves behind while bopping to a jiggle or sophisticated mind. Sweet, you will find the stem that you lick for the next letter you're going to send. And then um, let's see, 55. The one and its opposite. What you see is wonder framed in tourists' gapes as much as locals' hanger caught, uh, caught in closing doors. Within a grin, a crack. Behind a step, a limp. I could dance till night loses its dark mood and sleeps whole into a golden coat. Trees grave for running in the skies so viscerally, they bud leaves, color sleep bruises, and jump on kites. And uh, Lady Longing. This is when this is one of the first poems actually that I wrote here, and I was so actually I didn't want to enter malls and stores. Like, because I was a, like afraid to miss something, okay? So this actually is a poem about that. A lace of longing on a cake of steel is the gift you just landed, get back, laying your hand on her neck. You tip to dance miles and miles from Grand Central to City Hall. You, unsatisfied lover, who do not dare to enter a mall for the fear of missing one sigh, one look from your mistress wiggling around you. Day by day, you track runs in her stockings, holes on her armpits. Her morning breath can cook epics of rye and chili, cold air and sour chips. At midnight, you can get a gold piece pool as a good night kiss. Success can be too sweet and mine your smile. So you go and look for the clean mouth of the broken souls. And there you walk the carpet of splinters lie down from South Ferry all the way up to Pelham Parkway. You can collect every bit of shattered dreams can't bring home the unspeakable face, the death of a look, the dismay on a pace. You walk side by side, your beauty and bully. The city is no liar. The city is no joker. She just does the favor to turn her eyes from the clock, pretending not to see the time she wastes playing around with her silly devotee. And the silly devotee, it's me, of course. And of course, the remedy, it's about Coney Island. To make Coney Island drop its sad smile, I would set up a bonfire, collect paper petals, paint them with poetry, Dante, Neruda, Dylan, of course, sprinkle them down the skimpy fabric of its clown pants and have dimples button its cheeks. To make your tears swim back to sea and have your chest be washed again with rays of light, 
days of delight. I would bring your body, your pangs and distress, afford the restored cheer on Coney Island's shore. So in my journey as a poet, um, this is about New York, but I'm also drawn to certain, let's say thematic regions where I like to dwell. Solitude, pain, wonder, uh, love, love, but also like omens or feelings of something unspeakable hovering upon us, humankind. Um, I never get tired actually to go back to those regions. We can call them universals. I like personally to call them deep-rooted obsessions. So here are like some of them. And yeah, let's see. This is titled Men, and I, with men, I mean mankind. So men are no trees. A foot is no root. Branches and arms wave to different swarms. Men are no sons. Well, they can be at times, but just in the glow, some of them ooze in works of art or certain looks like Mozart and Louis Brooks. Men are dinghies and kites cruising seas and skies, tiny insects on some blue skin striving for a dot to rest. And when they find it, up on air or down to earth, looking for the next. And this is about love. Sorry? Okay, <laughs> I was hearing somebody. Time as a novel. The instant an egg crushes its head on the merciless edge of your frying pan, and there your breakfast is smiling back, or the gore second before a bubble walks into its death wearing pink and teal are paragraphs you can steal from the Times novel to describe what love makes you feel. Um, a stain. And this is, I mentioned before, like a, a nomen or a, a bad feeling hovering. On your way home after a day of scorn, missed chances or simple, simple jokes, you overlook the barefoot, the dope eye of a human being, duping her demons in a red old top on the pillowcase, framing your head in your night over, a stain is getting closer. Um, love, absolutely. You are the lighthouse, the lost call, the abracadabra with its wall, Water that kisses a parched mouth, the flower of life blossoming out, the golden line my tongue cannot etch, an Amazon her bold stretch, the rust on the wagon moving forward into lands of iron, light which breeds the night and the day delivered with no fight. Um, the blue butterfly. This is part of a long poem, um, like five sections are in it. I'm reading the fourth. The poem is titled Love Trip in New York City. And the section is the blue butterfly. I used to speak in scribbles before sending the pilgrim adventures of my fingertips to collect the artworks crafted by your looks. The circles you walk around, the syllables fled 
from the economics of discussions, the red fish of ideas and occasions slipped away from your home. I will be the land, storing your sheds, sipping in your drops, and the blue butterfly that from there will arise will be the proof of the sky flickering in our tremulous being. And um, the hole in the universe. The prodigy we wear in the middle of the night, our glow was visible from Sinatra Drive up to Hamilton Heights. The brightness that shined when an intuition flashed through your mind, the fluorescent words I squeezed from language to mimic the effect on my little notepad. Then one day, a line cracked on a baby cheek. A boat on the lake amid Central Park coveted wreckage, and the 2,027 bridges stapling land to water on the nation of the natives pulled like stitches on a fresh lane finger. As big as New York is, from Wakefield down to Bay Ridge, it was not enough to hold and encompass the glorious apocalypse of us without us. It will take ages for people to realize the rayless sun they see in full moon nights is the whole love etched to escape the universe. If I can interrupt. So, um, yes. Yes, there are also questions in the chat. Yeah, uh, so, yeah I cannot so, see them, but ask, please, absolutely. Yes, uh, I don't know how long you, you were thinking of. Oh. Um, so if you have, um, if you are almost at the end, we can yes. ask the questions at the, uh, at the end of your uh, presentation. Yeah, now I'm, I'm done with the collection and with the English poetry, but I think it would be interesting because I'm I'm also an, a poet about in Italian, so it would be interesting maybe to see my Italian poetry, and if I translate my Italian poetry, what happens? But first, I can absolutely uh, reply to questions. So it's okay. Perfect. I think it's better to also to see your Italian poetry and then to keep all the questions at the end, just okay. to yes, because you know people often ask me. Uh, why I write poetry in two languages. And I answer, um, feeling very guilty about this, that in this way I bypass translation. And I feel guilty because I am translator myself, you know. Um, but when poetry is on the table, I leave translation in the bag, as I said, as I say. So I start from the language from a word actually. Uh, and it is, it would be, I think it is even more primeval than a word, it's sound basically. So if a word or a sound um, belongs to Italian, the poem that will end you will be in Italian. And if a word of a sound belongs to English, the poem that will end you will be in English. So it is as easy as that, you know? So I would have never written my English poems in Italian and vice versa. I would have never written my Italian poetry in English. And um, once I was invited to lecture to like um, a college class of um, Italian students um, in a literary translation course. And as an experiment, as an exercise, I translated some poems in English of mine into Italian and some Italian poems of mine into English to show how epic the, the fail was and how disappointed I was. So we can maybe have a look at a couple of them and you will see by yourself, you know, how miserable this can be. <laughs> so I will read it in Italian, okay? And this is, um, is a, a poem that I'm really, you know, 
I kind of I'm, I'm fond of this poem, and it it is part of Luciole in Palma la Notte, um, the first collection in Italian that I have, and it's titled Il Petit Rosso. Guardo attraverso il vetro delle ali di una mosca. Ringrazio la penna verde che traccia piccole mappe sulle foglie dei pioppi. Ascolto una ciglia annaspare nel mare di uno sguardo. L'arsenico in grammi cui l'invidia ricorre per oscurare la fiamma dell'umano sentire. Dentro puoi essere manicomi deserti, cantieri non finiti, spiagge piene di nulla o fucili senza la caccia. Ma alle 2.38 un pettirosso corteggia, due tetti e un terrazzo. È il modo che ha il cielo di sanguinare bellezza. So there is a rhythm in this poem that, you know, is not in the English translation. And of course, this translation is not something artistic, you know, it's something, let's say, to convey the meaning, okay? So maybe if I put some more effort and thought into it, something better would come out. But for the time being, for me, it's not satisfactory enough. And if I show you something else, like, uh, let me find it here. So these two poems belong to a new collection that I have, which is forthcoming in the fall. It's titled La Rossa Goletta, uh, The Red Schooner. And um, yeah, you can have a look at the English and you can listen to the Italian. Alieno. Una mosca rossa molesta il soffitto. A terra una caravella si atteggia a stivaletto. Sgranano gli occhi le idee alla tapparella. Se non tremo, tutto è alieno. I cannot even look at the English, you know, because the Italian, the music goes in, in a way that the English doesn't. So, yeah, this is also true for the next one. Tutte in una. Even the title, you know, you, I had to add women because otherwise you don't get the female plural of tutte. Tutte in una. Un impasto di aria e pollini, di acque sorgive, robusti neuroni, notturni lustrini. Quella ragazza, dalla forma bambina, in braccio alla madre, ha dentro una donna che accenderà un lume una lingua di buio per alcune persone, per altre è posvero, con buona pace di Omero. Quella ragazza, che sarai tu, che era mia nonna ed è nostro fratello, non, non attende i piani di Dio, ha una pistola per cervello. So, for me, the music is really vital in, a, in, in poetry and in a poem, because as I mentioned before, I start there. So when you, you translate it, you translate a poem, you have so many um, elements uh, in your hands that you, know, you cannot convey them all. You are forced uh, most of the time to let something slip. And in these poems, you know, it's music for me. It, it, in English, they don't work. And if I would read the English, so here, let me see. I read these two poems to you uh, before. Spring Now is the first that I read. And, you know, at some point I read Time as a Novel and it's the same, you know. So the Italian translation totally, you know, is disappointing for me, especially spring now. If you know, I, it, it, in Italian, it sounds horribile, I would say, nostrazio, terrible. So this, for me, this is a good exercise though. It's an exercise that proves that for me at least, uh, the sparkle of a poem start with a sound most of the time. Okay, other times, 
As I said before, it could be something that I spot around, but most of the time is the sound or a word, as I say. So I'm in for questions now. <laughs> So let me interrupt here, yes. So I don't see the questions. Yes. Probably. Sorry, I have to unmute my, myself and thank yeah, you, Sarah. Okay. I will read this, the questions to you. And mm -hmm. really thank you for just providing a glimpse into your creative process. And I think there are so many questions also related to that. The first one is from Renato. Uh, um, what motivated you to begin writing poetry? Did you become a poet as a result of your translation work or did you write poetry before that? Wrestling with intro. words, yes. as you just, I just finished, wrestling yes. with words as building blocks of artistic expression isn't for everyone, I suspect. What does poetry give you? Okay, um, thank you for the question. I started writing poetry when I was 17. So it was before the translation and translation. And I started as, you know, a, a, as a teenager starts writing a poetry. Um, when you start and you are so young, it's uh, what you get is almost com confessional poetry. So you write about yourself basically, but very soon I noticed that really what I intrigued by was and I remember and I still do this I kept lists of words that stroke me and I kept working around words and this is also what I do now so really I have my bags full of like notes and or even in the mobile I pick words and then from that word I I you know I work around them and kind of come out with the poem. It's a very, it's an exercise of patience, I would say. It's really a labor of love and also it's meticulous. You know, you can have that initial spark, but it's just a spark. Then it's sweat. You have to sweat on the page to recreate, you know, to create a music. For me, every poem has its own music. And I know about it when it's finished, right? Okay, so what was the second part of the, of the question that I forgot? What, what does poetry give you? Ah, yes. Oh, an incredible amount of pleasure. I mean, I do it because of the pleasure it gives me. And it is really connected to language, okay? Um, of course, Italian is my mother tongue. So I am, you know, it's my mother. So it, it, it's domestic in a way. And I love her, I love the language in, with this sort of mother-daughter feeling. Whereas with English, it's a different relationship. With English, it's my candy language, I say it. I love to feel English, to feel English in my mouth. So pleasure is involved in the process. And um, I would say that English is, um, is the crush that you never stop dating or wanting to date you know it's uh, it i'm always since it's not my mother tongue it it's always new to me i it's a new discovery for me and it requires um i would say humbleness but also recklessness you know because you know you are not in your own territory it's something different and I love feeling that, I love that thrill. So I would say that poetry gives me pleasure, a pleasure that fiction gives me, but in a very, very small amount. <laughs> so I really need to write poetry to make up 
or the lack of pleasure, you know. Even if I try to, you know, bring poetry in my fiction as well as much as I can, so that I don't feel that nostalgic. <laughs> so I hope I answered. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you, Sarah. And then there is Maria who says, your poetry is so visual and compassionate. Mm -hmm. Was there a certain experience that happened that turned your sight from the skyscrapers to the ground, to the horizontal? Oh, that's a good question. You know, when you arrive in this city, as I said, I was immediately, you know, the enthusiastic, I would say tourist in a way, you know, but something was missing in me. I find it so superficial in a way. So I, after really, it was soon, this shifting happened very, very soon. And there was no specific trigger in that. I didn't kind of witness something or, you know, something specific. It's, it is really just the city that gives you so many options there of misery and also sadness and you know people that i i cannot really stop looking at to and question and wonder what it's beyond you know that sad smile or those sad eyes so it's i think it's it's really the city and also you as a person, I think. I have always been very curious in my life. And, you know, if you're a curious animal and you happen to land in New York City, you find yourself, you know, in a sort of, in your own environment because there is so much to be curious about. So no, there was not like a specific uh, episode in this. Yes. And then there is Ivana. Uh, your street photography is absolutely amazing. When you take photos of people, how do you manage not to be seen what you are doing? Do you use your cell phone? And also, I also add another question. Do you ever ask permission or you just steal your pictures? I steal my picture. <laughs> and I use my mobile phone. And I think that, you know, people are so into themselves they didn't they don't even realize you know that somebody else is looking at them this is something that happens you know in the subway i don't think that it's something uh, expressively linked to new york city i think it's something that many big cities experiences this sort of being in your own you know dimension and not paying attention and what is happening around you. I didn't ask for, for permission and I feel a little bit like a criminal, criminal in this, but yeah, I know that you know many photographers do that. You know, you, you take pictures passing by and you know, I think that there's nothing really intrusive in, in those pictures at least. I try to be very considerate and not to for instance, take pictures of small childs or you know or children, you know, or from a distance or from the back. Like for instance, the two kids playing cards, they are, you know, from a certain distance. The exception maybe is the two brothers, the blondie, the blonde brothers. I just was, you know, creating my or my own narratives in my head, like. You know, they have the Trinity, um, like um, school sort of shirt on them. So I was thinking, hmm, let's think about their upbringing. What are their parents doing? So it's me kind of then roaming away from my subjects. But yeah, yeah, this is, a, I, you know, I actually thought about it, you know, but oh, they are going to ask me if I asked for permission for the photographs. <laughs> So I am a bit of a criminal. <laughs> uh, but you, you really cap, really captured the moment, the authenticity of that moment. Otherwise, it would be lost if you ask yeah. for permission. Yeah, um, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Sam <laughs> is also asking, have you looked at the impact of sugar ill gentr gentrification? Oh, OK. I lived in Sugar Hill for one year. And then I moved. Now I live in the Upper West Side. 
upper upper west side so let's say uh, a little bit southern than before um now i know as i mentioned well sugar hill is started out as african american then latin american community also arrived there but now you know white people live there so it it is becoming gentrified as basically any borough in new york this is the issue of new york city and uh, you know every uh, neighborhood is becoming gentrified starting from Brooklyn all the way up to Harlem. That's, that is a major issue the city is facing, you know. Also because I was uh, talking uh, to Ariana before we started, the problem with New York now, it, it is incredibly expensive and it, it is getting more and more expensive, especially after the pandemic. So many people are also leaving the city because it's it's too expensive to live. And, and so, you know, with this phenomenon of gentrification and the, the spike of prices, leaving the city is becoming tough. And um, yeah, so yes, this is what we are facing. Yes. But this, is, this also is affecting many big cities like London, Paris, Berlin. I know they are very expensive city. New York is the most expensive in the world, actually. Maria is asking, when you were translating for Dion Brand, did it feel like you were writing your own poetry and books because of the intense thought needed for rhythm? Um, you know, when, when you translate a work of art of somebody else, you're very cautious and you're very aware that what you are doing is their work. Of course, it's your language. If, you know, I'm translating it into Italian, it's a bit of my language. But I've always, you know, I'm always, I always want to be very clear with myself, you know, not to trespass, you know, that is important. And I don't consider, you know, poetry in translation my own poetry, no. My poetry is the poetry that starts with me and ends with me. And Anna is asking, Anna, Anna Lombardo, I know her, from, she's connecting from Italy, she's a poet herself. She's asked, you say about the pleasure you feel about writing, writing your, your lines, lines and what do you expect your poems do to other people? Yeah, I mean, like for me, if the other people, if the reader experiences like a tiny bit of pleasure while reading my poetry, you know, that, that is my dream. That is, you know, I'm the most, I'm the happiest woman and poet in the world because that is the, the thing. And it's also in addition to pleasure, which is of, of course, vital in any artistic form, I think, it is also thinking. So for me, when I hang around, when I, you know, when I feed myself with literature and poetry, what I really look for is to think. So a poem makes me think, it cracks my mind open. That is what I look for in a work of art, you know, a movie, um, like a novel or poetry. So why? Because when I think I feel alive and feeling alive is the feeling, if you ask me, that I always want to feel more than any feeling. Because if you think about love, of course, it's nice to feel love. But love then has different degrees. You know, you know what I'm talking about. So it changes, you know, it's volatile. Feeling alive, you know, that hubris, that enthusiasm, uh, that elan um, towards life, that is absolutely stable. And I've always felt it when I approach a work of art. So 
pleasure, but also thought, thinking, you know, that is a reader to feel. Thank you. And Diego Bastianuti, he's a writer and a poet himself from Vancouver, but of Italian origin. He asks, how has your experience in New York affected your Italian poetry? That's a good question. I think my English poetry and my Italian poetry are very different. So my English poetry is more, I would say, um, interested into like um, even everyday subjects. It's, it's visual, as somebody said, it's down to earth more than my Italian poetry. My Italian poetry is much more on the universal side and I still have to understand why. Why is it so? But explore two different worlds with two different linguistic tools. So I'm happy about that, actually. And I don't think that my being in New York has affected my Italian poetry. No. It has affected my English poetry. And Sam is asking, are there any topics that you avoid in your poetry for others? No, I think I am the worst censor of myself. I don't censor myself because, you know, a poet, an artist, a writer, they have to feel free, you know? And so even if I can, um, I don't know, tackle, thorny issues, I'll do it because I have to do it. And there is the, this last question. So I that try I... to stay away from, yes? Yes, this yes, last... go ahead. <laughs> yeah, no, no, just to finish. So I, I try to stay away from the fear of, you know, saying something or, you know, dealing with something too hot. Of course, I'm very um, aware of the power that I have in my hands as a writer. So I am very careful. Um, this does not mean that I shut myself up. I'm careful. And yes, there is one last question and then we are at the, almost at the end of our event. Um, by Diego again, are there realities in the English world that find no correspondence at all in the Italian reality? Um, reality, what do you mean by reality? If, yeah, if maybe she or he can. Uh, Diego, perhaps you would like to unmute yourself and. and yes, I would like maybe know a little bit better of the question. For example, because reality is general, right? So yeah. something that you have lived, let's say, in the English world in New York, mm -hmm. that you write about, but that you can find no correspondence with any experience that you've had in the Italian world, in Italy. I and think, therefore you find no, uh -huh. the, the vocabulary is missing in your Italian. Well, that's a good question. Um, let's say that when I feel that the vocabulary is not there, I don't write about it, you know. So you don't translate. <laughs> because the... everything starts from the vocabulary. Hmm. Yeah, no, ah, the translation, you mean? Okay. Yeah. Oh my God, yes. When I translate, for instance, Dion Brand, okay? She has like uh, poetry, which is written partly in pidgin English. We don't have such thing as a pidgin Italian. We have dialects, but yes. 
it's something completely different. So it was really tough for me to come up with a strategy to basically handle the use she was doing of the pidgin English because she's, um, she was born in Granada in the Caribbean and she moved to Canada. So she uses in some, you know, also novels, but is especially in poetry, um, this Caribbean pidgin. So I tried to find a standard Italian and, you know, I tried to color the Italian in a way that could, you know, do justice to her use of pidgin without sounding fake or, you know, dialect-like. It would be really um, making a disservice to her work. So that was very tough for me. Yes, the use of pigeon. Good question. The reason, the reason uh, I, just the yeah. reason I mentioned this question is because I do translation of my own poetry uh -huh. And the last, uh, the last book was uh, dealing with uh, uh, homeless and drug addicts in the uh -huh. Vancouver area. Right. And that language I know because I have lived among those people. I have picked it up living here. But I did not have such an experience in Italy. Therefore, the vocabulary was missing. And I had to go and search for it in very dark spaces in the yeah. online in order to find the language that these people use to express their emotions. You know, I totally relate because as a translator, when you face a text, sometimes you have these sort of micro languages that you need to delve into yes. like you did and I did myself. You know, you look around in dark websites or wherever to you know, be informed and to try to find a way first to understand and then to find you know, uh, an equivalent yes. that, that could be satisfying. You know? So uh, maybe in the audience there, there is Franca Cavagnoli who translated Naked Lunch um, by Barrows into Italian. And it was really, you know, a tough job and she did an amazing job, but it took time, you know, because there is this, you know, drug related world, you know, of uh, like the vocabulary that you have to go and find like a, like a similar uh, experience, linguistic experience in Italian. So yeah, this is something that we go through as translators. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you everyone, to everyone uh, for being here with us. And let's have Renato Zane, our president, uh, uh, wrap up the, this event and just say a final, final, some final comments. Hey, thank you, Ariana, And thank you very much, Sara. That was very informative for me. As someone who doesn't read a lot of poetry and finds it work, <laughs> mm -hmm. I find you very refreshing, very refreshing. I liked how even when you speak, you, you sound poetic, as you said, you know, sometimes poems shimmer into being. And, uh, you know, you have this lightness of being yourself, but then you talk about poetry not being ethereal, but really being of the earth, covered in dirt, I think you said, which is really interesting. Um, so I learned a lot. I learned a lot. I think my personal favorite was uh, Subway Semantics. Right. And, uh, <laughs> and Nefertiti, right. of course. So um, thank you so much for enlightening us, for helping us to be exposed to a different aspect of artistic expression. Uh, it's good for us who, those of us who don't write very much to be able to understand this world a little bit better and appreciate your love of, of words. Um, I, I just wanted to thank Ariana for organizing this event. And we, you know, as an organization, we now turn our sights towards next month. Uh, as you know, we do a, a monthly event. And next month, we're very excited to be able to uh, host uh, Carlo Fierens, uh, who is a musician, to Vancouver for a special recital concert at uh, the UBC, the University of British Columbia uh, Chan Center. 
So Arianna, in, co in collaboration with the Istituto Italiano di Cultura di Toronto, has, been, uh, has found a way to invite Pablo Fierens for an in-person performance. So we invite all of you to sign up for that. If you're in Vancouver or if you're in Seattle like Maria, please feel free to, to come up. We, we'd love to see you. That's April the 6th uh, at 6.30 p.m. at the Chan Center. You can find all the information on the Dante Society BC website. Uh, and in addition, as usual, I always mention the language school. So if anyone is interested in signing up for a language course for the spring, the, the courses start on April the 10th, and there's always a discount for members. So if you're not a member of the society, please consider joining and becoming a member. I see Tom, our secretary, is on, online as well. Hi, Tom. Tom handles all of the memberships, and he would love to receive uh, a membership uh, from one of you. So thank you all. I really appreciate the opportunity to meet you in person uh, through, through Zoom, of course. Yeah, <laughs> thank <well>. you. <laughs> thank you, Sada, for these wonderful glimpses of New York City and of the creative life of an artistic poet. Uh, really appreciate your time. Uh, and that's it for me. Ariana. back to you. Thank you all. Thank you. Yes, I just have to to say I just have to say thank you to thank you all. And there there is a link in the chat if you want to um, register for the event in April for our in person event. And so thank you, Sarah, again. And I, uh, see yeah, you next I just want to thank the people who wrote beautiful things in the chat that I you know I managed to read them now. So thank you, guys. <laughs> I really really appreciate and honestly. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Renato. And thank you, Arianna, for inviting. Thank you. Bye, -bye to everyone. <laughs> and enjoy the sun. Yes. <laughs> <laughs>